In my first conversation with the acclaimed astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson about his book Astrophysics for People in a Hurry, we explored the universe from the Big Bang to Sir Isaac Newton. Now the director of the world-famous Hayden Planetarium takes us on a journey from Newton to our most recent understanding of the universe and our role in it. Dr. Tyson, I don't know if this has something to do with the space-time continuum, but thank you for coming back a week later. It only <laughs> feels like a minute or two has went by. I did change my underwear, yes, okay. <laughs> you know, we said, uh, I, I told our viewers that we would take them through Newton, and now we would go from Newton to the modern time, mm -hmm. and especially the big bump that came when Einstein got into the picture, because that seems where in the cosmic history the next big shift took place. Yeah, definitely a big bump. Uh, I don't know that it was more of a big bump than Newton's bump. They were each a big bump in our understanding of the fabric of the universe. So, so yeah, in fact, Einstein and, and Newton are, are kindred spirits separated by two and a half centuries uh, because they each came forth, starting with Newton, he had a theory of motion and a theory of gravity that explained everything anyone had ever seen. And it turned out that actually had limits that unknown to Newton that Einstein says, I see those limits, I got that covered. Here's an updated theory of motion and theory of gravity that accounted for all the places that Newton's laws had failed, but also enclosed Newton's laws as a special case of this broader understanding of the universe. So if you take Einstein's equations and put in low mass and low speeds, low accelerations, they become Newton's laws. So it's not one being discarded for another, it's one being a deeper understanding of how the universe works and closing another as a special case of the whole. Well, one of the things that in a sense close everything, you, you, you term constants, the certain constants that we have. And it happens to be one of the biggest constants is Einstein's theory or speed of light constant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who would have thought that here's this thing called light that has a speed, and this speed is the same no matter who's measuring it, no matter how fast you're moving, no matter where you're going or where you're coming from. We will all measure exactly the same speed of light in a, in a vacuum. Now, you're an astrophysicist, but yet in the book you're even aware that there is, I don't want to say a well, you actually call it a clash. I'm not sure if it is, but the clash between the cosmic gravitational forces and the quantum mechanics that we're that Einstein himself was so desperately trying to connect together in that what we'll call the theory of everything or that unified field theory. Yeah, uh, that was a major exercise. It still continues to this day. This is what our uh, top uh, string theorists are doing. It's really be called a string hypothesis because when we use the word theory, I'd like to reserve it for ideas that have that um, explain a lot of what we see and makes successful predictions of what we have yet to discover. And that's where you get evolutionary theory, quantum theory, gravitational theory, the special theory of relativity. So if you have an idea that's not yet tested, we just call it a hypothesis. And but yeah, um, we. Uh, these are particularly potent ideas that are carrying us into the future. And you use these words because I think this sums it up beautifully. Many natural phenomena manifest multiple physical laws operating at once. So that's where that connectivity comes again. Yeah, yeah. And you don't want to stovepipe your thinking or observations too tightly, all right? Because often there's a cross, there's a crosstalk, a cross-pollination, I should say, between two branches of thought that gives you a deeper understanding of them both that wouldn't have ever come about staying within your lane. So um, that, that's why if you go far enough back, you don't see the natural philosophers dividing themselves up into biologists, chemists, and physicists. That was just not what was going on. They were all just talking to one another at all times. So, uh, so we risk losing opportunities of discovery simply because the universe 
is not drawing the line between chemistry, physics, and biology. We are in our, in our schools, in our classes, and in our textbooks. Uh, so well, so then you, would you like to see somehow a, a more bringing together of, of these disciplines? Because as we talked in the last episode, I mentioned the periodic table. Well, there is chemistry right in with astrophysics. Right there. Right there. In your face. So we, we should somehow in our educational system find a way to tie this better. Yes, and we don't. And so that's unfortunate. If we did, I think many more discoveries would emerge naturally from that educational process. And what connectivity does is it empowers you to think more creatively about what is or is not true in the world. And, and without it, these sciences just become these, these tasks, these labors that you endure during your years in school, and you can't wait till it's over, and then it's done, and then you, you close the compartment and put it on a shelf or resell the books or whatever. The fact that you can even do that is evidence that nowhere in that arc, that educational arc, were you connecting it to not only other sciences but to life. And if you knew how deeply all of this matters to life, I don't know that you would sort of lock the box back and put it, put it on the shelf and leave it behind because you have other concerns you need to tend to. I love this. You say another class of universal truths is conservation laws. Now again, those aren't just in the cosmic. They're not, they're chemical. They're in uh, the original heat laws of, of thermal dynamics. Yeah, yeah. So there it's is everywhere. again this connection of universal truths that, and one of them being conservation laws, but they exist everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. And once you understand that there's certain quantities that are conserved in the universe, it is immensely potent when you design your next round of experiments or when you interpret results that you had never seen before. So one of them, for example, is um, angular momentum. That's conservation of angular momentum. I, I have to say, well, that was the one I've never heard of before. Oh. I heard of the constant, the speed of light, but yeah. that one I've never heard of so before. So angular momentum is, you're spinning, all right, and you have a certain mass set into spinning, all right? So there's a way to quantify how much mass there is that is doing the spinning. There's a way to do that, okay? And if, if you want to stop this from spinning, something else has to spin up for you to stop that. that. That angular momentum has to go somewhere. And this is a powerful, it gives us powerful access to phenomena in the universe we wouldn't otherwise understand. Take, for example, a star that's spinning. If it takes some of its mass and scatters it out into space, it is taking away some of that angular momentum, putting it out here. This has to slow down to compensate for that. Well, you know, you, you brought something up, and uh, this may not be related, but at least it, it, it's related in my mind. So correct me where I'm wrong and set me straight where I'm... I, I, do both. But you talk about we have this vision of Earth circling around the mm -hmm. sun, but yet that's not the case again. What really is happening is this, they're circling, almost doing a dance with each, with, with each other in a certain way. Yeah, so the center of mass. Because that's what you were talking about, yeah, that or, mass. Or, or, or more it's precisely the center of gravity between two objects. It could be anywhere between their two centers, but it will never be at one or the other of the centers of these two objects. So even Earth, which is tiny, the Sun, which is large, the center of mass between the, of gravity between the two of them is slightly off-center from the Sun. So that if you're going to observe the Sun while Earth is going around it, the Sun will be just kind of doing a little jig like this. Okay? Uh. And meanwhile, the Earth is making the big loop because the Sun has most of the mass. So the Earth is going to be doing most of the moving. And the more massive your planet is, the farther away from the center of the sun your center of gravity will be. Let me probe this a little bit because... So, just, just to summarize that, in go, other words, go right ahead. planets don't orbit stars. Planets and stars orbit their common center of gravity. And it's this movement of the host star that we monitor when we discover exoplanets. Because we can't, the, exo, typically the exoplanets are lost in the glare. 
There's secondary ways of discovering them, but typically they're lost in the glare. And all you can see is the star doing this. And so you infer the presence of a planet tugging on the star, making it do that. And if you have multiple planets, then the star is responding in multiple ways. And you decode that otherwise what looks like sort of random jerks, that you decode that, and out of that you can determine how many planets are orbiting the star. Well, part of this whole book that's fascinating is your own way of thinking about the invisible stuff that's out there. You, in a number of cases, you say, we're always concerned about the planets, but it's the place between the planets, we're, or, or the moons that are even more important than the planets, or the stars, but it's the dark matter, it's the dark. So basically, everything that we see and get enamored by, according to you, and I'm assuming all of physics, is not the most dynamic stuff. The most dynamic stuff is somewhat what we don't see at all. Yeah, I, I devote a whole chapter to the stuff between the planets and between the galaxies, just to get a sense that we're not just simply dotted with these islands of matter, that there are things that permeate what otherwise looks like empty space, and that would include what we call dark matter, what we call dark energy. There's also other stuff there as well. I mean, the, the solar system, the sun and its eight planets. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> leaving poor blue. Plutonium get over we're it. keeping, get yeah, over yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, keep it Plutonium, <laughs> but we're still <laughs> dropping Pluto out. The sun and its eight planets, but it's got moons around those planets, it's got asteroids, it's got comets, and wayward debris. Earth plows through several hundred tons of meteors a day. And that's today, after it's been doing that for four billion years. Imagine what it was like at the beginning of the formation of the Earth and the solar system. Uh, so, the, most of what this is burns up in the atmosphere harmlessly as shooting stars. Occasionally there's a chunk that's big enough that it can hit the ground. Generally won't do too much damage. If it's too big, you can start disrupting civilization and in the limit render us extinct. Well, the shocking thing that I read was the amount of Martian rocks that hit the Earth. I forgot the number, but it, uh, it's, it's thousands. It's, yeah, it's 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 high, it's thousands of tons of. Now we didn't know this until we did the math. Okay, remember math is the language of the universe. We once we had, sorry, it wasn't just the math; it was the computing power to calculate the math. So if you have an asteroid that strikes the surface of a planet, it creates such a shock wave that it can fling surrounding material out into space exceeding the escape velocity of the planet itself. So there it is, floating between the planets. And ultimately, it's going to find a home to fall down on. And so if you do the math, how many times Mars has been hit, how far away Mars is, how much total matter would be scattered in the universe, and how long it's been since then, you come up with thousands of tons of Mars meteorites on Earth. But, wait, but the fun part of this is... <laughs> it's all fun to the me. The fun part of this is, you can now imagine an expedition on the moon to discover rock artifacts that have been blasted off the Earth and landed on the moon, but blasted in some prehistoric time. So if there's a rock that had stowaway bacteria or a fossil from yet a previous time, you can find Earth fossils on the surface of the moon that'll be in pristine condition. Because there's no erosion, no rain, no nothing. So then how come we're not reading every day that someone's getting knocked in the head with a Martian rock? Well, Earth's surface is huge, and that tonnage is over all of time. So, yeah. And you also And, and, and your, the surface of your head is not a very big cross-section of impact <laughs> with the surface of the Earth. So Thanks, because my mom also said I always had a swell head. Okay. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But but you know what you say also it's Jupiter that somehow is protecting us from a lot of the debris that yeah. I found how how is that yeah, Jupiter's in like our big brother that's who's what you said protecting us from school bullies so Jupiter is farther out from the sun than we are comets come in from the distant solar system and as they come down their their trajectories wherever they're coming from they sort of focus down near the sun because they make very tight orbits 
around the sun as they head back out. Well, we happen to be an object orbiting relatively close to the sun. We're down in here. So, so do we get our full share of comets and asteroids headed? No. You know why? Because some of those trajectories will feel the gravity of Jupiter itself. And be attracted to and, that. And, and Jupiter, not so much attracted and fall in, although that does happen. What's more common is Jupiter's gravity will disrupt the orbit of the comet and have it then cast it off into a complete other direction, shielding the inner solar system from what would otherwise be a deadly shooting gallery. I want to go back for one second because there was a, a thing I wanted to touch upon when we were talking about con the conservation laws. And that was the one law that I think says there may not be, well, let's put it this way, entropy. Entropy comes from the, the, the laws of thermodynamics. And part of even, it seems like the theory of relativity when you look at E equals MC squared, it either played a role or followed the role of this notion of thermodynamics, of this conservation of energy and mass. So where does entropy fit within this cosmic dance? So entropy, just the general, so the formal term for the disorder right. of a system. And if a system is highly scattered, it's more disordered than if it's small. So the entropy of the universe is going up. Just let's get that clear, make that clear. It's going up in total. You can have pockets of the universe where the entropy drops, but that takes an investment of energy to do so, such as what the sun is doing for us. It's how the energy from the sun can be folded into the environment, and you can come out with structures that are highly ordered and not random, like life itself. Because Earth is not a closed system. It's an open system, constantly see receiving energy from outside. Now, one thing about the angle of momentum, I don't know if you realize this, but tides on the shorelines, um, the sloshing of the tides against the ocean shore, the net effect of that is to slow down Earth's rotation. So, Earth's rotation is slowing down. Well, if here's Earth and we're slowing down, where does that angular momentum go? That's right, you said before, it's gotta be shooting out somewhere. So, it is picked up by the moon, and so the moon is gaining angular momentum while we lose it. And the only way that can happen to the moon is if it ascends to higher orbits. So in fact, the moon every year is spiraling away from us by, I don't know, a couple inches, somewhere between two inches to one and a half and two inches, every year. So does that mean we will at some time not see it? Uh, it it'll get smaller and smaller over time, but a couple of inches a year is not you know, don't lose oh. sleep over this, uh. fate. But, but I love my moon, you know. <laughs> but as we slow down in our rotation, ultimately the moon wants to slow us down so much that we only face one side of us to it. This is science, but there is a little philosophy within the book. I want to first approach the science part and then go into the second part. Science, you say, is not just about seeing. It's about measuring. And if there's a problem, the baggage is in our brain. Yeah, if you have a problem with the result, you know, take up another profession. You, you, you should not be in advance judging whether something is true based on whether it makes sense to you. The measurement is everything. Now, it's possible for measurement to be flawed. That's, and in fact, it happens often. That's why in science, a truth is not what one person measures, it is whether multiple competing laboratories measure approximately the same result. Well, you if, when that happens, then we have what we call an emergent objective truth that is true outside of your five senses, which also means that it's true no matter whether you want to believe in it or not. And part of that truth seems to stem from this part of a philosophical thought that you write, ignorance is the natural state of mind for a research scientist. Oh, yeah. So therefore, if you think you know it all is when you're in trouble. It's when you realize you know nothing that you're in good hands. Yeah. I mean, in a weird way. I wouldn't say no completely nothing. I mean, right, no right, quite a of bit, course. But 
Uh, if you read newspaper headlines, every time a new result comes out scientifically, a common headline is, oh, scientists, uh, their cherished theories are now, are now put to the test, and they have to go back to the drawing board. As though we're sitting in our office with our legs up on the, on the desk, basking in our cosmic mastery uh, of the universe. No. No. We are always at the drawing board because you look for the place where you have the most unknown. That is where, the, perhaps, we think, there's the biggest chance of making a significant discovery. You're not going to hang out where we know everything. That's not interesting. It's what it is to be a scientist, to sit there stupefied by what we do not yet know. Keeping, try to keep one foot in the perimeter where we know stuff so that you don't float away. That can happen sometimes. It happens to the best of us. But, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we love not knowing. It's a celebration of potential for discovery. By us not knowing, again, will we feel, what's the feeling that's going to come out of that? And is it that feeling of insecurity? Is yeah. that that feeling, or is it that feeling of liberation yeah. that you talked about? That's, that's kind of a funny play because it's this, it fits in that mold. You ultimately have to learn to love the questions themselves because not all of them are, will lend themselves to an answer. And the greatest of scientists historically have been the ones that had such deep insight into nature, they knew what question to ask because that's what would then guide you to where the solutions would be found. And I think that is what, again, makes you feel significant versus insignificant, is the unknowingness is what connects you to the cosmic perspective well, it's, much it's, more than the knowingness if does. If you're not curious, the state of unknown is terrifying. If you're curious, the state of unknown is, is seduction. I mean, it, it operates on many levels. Consider the workplace, right? Imagine a boss giving a worker a task. And we know these, this exists. The worker might say, that's not in my job description. Or, I'm not trained to do that. You have to find someone else, all right? That is not a curious person. That's a, an itinerant person. There's another person you might give into. Is a, here's something, here's a task for you. Well, I've never seen that before. Great, I'll go figure it out. Well, that's not in my job description. Great, I will learn to figure that out. So this is what you find coursing through the veins and arteries of engineers and scientists. Give me a problem I've never seen before. Go ahead, I'm all over it. Oh, that's, uh, when, when I look for people to work with me, I'd rather them know nothing but have the enthusiasm and the confidence to know that they'll at least be curious enough to do everything in their power to figure out what it is. However, there's a flip side to that, just as a caution. Go ahead. You want to give them freedom to fail. Oh, you have to. Yes, and if without that, this won't work. Oh, because yeah. Because, it, it, in fact, the day you stop making errors is the evidence that you are no longer on the frontier of thought. I think every great on all levels, from theoretical physicists to actual engineers like, oh, let's use Edison even, the classic example of the thousand times I've learned not to make the light bulb, you know? Mm -hmm. You can't be afraid of that failure because you can't possibly, A, you, you, you'd have a paralysis that you wouldn't be able, able to even move forward, mm -hmm. and B, the joy of failure is what leads to the joy of exploration. And by the way, failure is not only an isolated dead end. Failure can then open another door previously unnoticed by you where that could, in fact, lead to the solution. And this show would not have existed if I didn't make a number of failures that led me to do this show. It was not success that brought me here. It was failing at other things that opened up this door. Mm -hmm. That's how, that, that's any successful person has just that kind of story to tell. Well, sir, one of the most successful persons is sitting right next to me. I want to end with your words. We do not simply live in this universe. The universe lives within us. Thank you, Dr. Tyson. Thank you. For living within us and sharing your universe with our universe. And thank you all for joining us. Now, before Dr. Tyson leaves, I'd like to leave you with these few more words 
from astrophysics for people in a hurry. At one time or another, every one of us has looked up at the night sky and wondered, what does it all mean? How does it all work? And what is my place in the universe? I'm Barry Kibrick. Between what it all means and how it all works is where we actually find our place in the universe. Thank you so much, Dr. Tyson. My pleasure. To connect with Barry, like him on Facebook and follow him on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, view past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his weekly blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Sam Ash Music, a proud sponsor of Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick. Sam Ash has been serving musicians since 1924. To unlock your inner musician, information is available at samash.com. Thank you.